long. Yeah, today is a uh, a long document. I uh, this is the sixth Sunday of Lent, and it completes our se a series on the Augsburg Confession. Uh, the document that's on the table is uh, Confession 20 and 21 will be our conversation today. Um, I was going to say something about that. Oh, um, next Sunday, next Sunday is Easter Sunday. And it was sudden, it was pointed out to me, I hadn't noticed that there is a worship service at 11 o'clock. So next Sunday, rather than compete with a worship service, I'm simply canceling class. No class, no adult elective, next Sunday only. Normally, I would have led a conversation. In fact, I developed a document on resurrection. But uh, again, I forgot that there was an 11 o'clock worship service. So um, the week after Easter is when we will begin our new series on Old Testament Bible stories, or if you want to give it an alternate title, your favorite Bible stories from Sunday school or something like that. And since keeping it simple, thinking chronologically, what's the first story in the Bible? Adam and Eve. So there we go. We've got two people, Adam and Eve, that are introduced in chapter two. So if you want to read ahead, get your homework done. Yeah. Uh, well, creation is in chapter, well, actually, creation is in chapter one and two. There's a creation story in one, and there's another creation story in two. Okay. Um, the story of Adam and Eve is definitely chapter two and three of Genesis. But if you want to throw in a little bit more of the uh, fuller story, Cain and Abel get you to chapter four. So chapter two, three, and four of Genesis for next, not, not next week, the week after next um, would be some good reading. Now, I'm going to, uh, I told this class a year ago that David Wesley was working on a, a musical number uh, with a, a teenage cellist. That was a year ago. It is finally available. Uh, it has taken a year for this to be developed. It's, it's really rather wonderful. Um, today, we were reading, for example, in, in, this, in the service we just had, we, um, as part of the worship service, the I can't find the words. Holy, holy, holy. Where is that? It's in the communion. Oh, I'm missing it. I don't know where it is. Here it is. It's called the Sanctus. It's on page eight. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might. Anyway, in, in the book of Revelation, there is a section, chapter five, the angels are discussing who is worthy to open the seals of the, of the scrolls. And of course, the answer is the lamb that was slain is worthy. So that's what this song is about. It, it's, it's, it's just a, it's chapter five of Revelation. It's only verse 12 and 13. So it's not a lot of text, but this is a worship song. It is... Um, foretaste of the worship before the throne is what he said. It is quite amazing. Um, okay, uh, I've got to change the share. Turn off that. Go to that large document again. Where is it? Here it is. Okay, hopefully. Ah. Uh, Okay, finally, we are starting uh, a discussion. We have a half hour 
on um, good works and worship of saints. Both of these um, are specific criticisms of the Catholic Church at the time of the Lutheran Reformation. Um, the Catholics uh, at that time were very works oriented. You needed to do things. You needed to participate in pilgrimages and say prayers and do a number of things. Remember the whole issue of indulgences that really upset Luther. Uh, you basically were paying money to the church uh, for what was called a temporal, that's a, that means a time-related reduction of your sentence in purgatory. Assume, for example, that you are, you are a saved person, but you still had some sins hanging around. Protestants don't think like that. Catholics did. And so you were going to be in purgatory for 10,000 years or some, some number like that. And so you might want to buy down the amount of time. <laughs> anyway, these are good works. These are works that you could do to lessen your purgatory. Um, and the Lutheran position is just absolutely not. There is no connection. The summary of this one is that there is no connection between what you do and your salvation. Um, up in the fellowship, we have a simpler version of that. There is nothing I can do to make God love me more. And also the corollary is there's nothing I can do that will make him love me less. Okay. In other words, the love of God is constant and it is irrelevant what you have done or not done. Yeah. You can't be saved by works. You can only be saved by grace. That's right. That's, that is the, another way of saying what I'm, I'm talking about. We are saved by grace through faith alone. No works are involved. So the, the, the Lutherans are arguing here that the, the Catholics' emphasis on works is just flat wrong. There is nothing good. <laughs> There's nothing good about good works. They don't add anything to your salvation. Now, There's nothing good spiritually. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the correction. Now, but here was the problem. It, it does turn out that the Catholics heard this criticism and partially agreed with it. Okay, they, they said, you know, we, we have been overemphasizing works, but you guys are wrong. You're throwing out all the works. Saying works are irrelevant? No, the Catholic position shifted to a cooperation. Yes, you need to have faith. Yes, Christ needs to save you but you participate in that salvation. This was the new Catholic position. You participate in that salvation. At that time, yes, yes. At that time. At that time. They moved, very, they moved rather quickly. And to a, a little bit of both argument. Yes, we, we need grace, but yes, you still need works. And the word need was in there in both cases. So, and, and so now the Lutherans are having to shift and they're arguing, well, it, it, they, the Lutherans admit this is a better argument, but it's still wrong. Okay. You didn't quite get it right. That's right. Yes. Okay. So the, the, the Lutherans said, okay, it is, it's good that you're admitting that grace is in the formula. That's good. But you're still, there is nothing added by the works. Nothing is added by the works. So let, let me get to the reading of the first. Uh, now, I, I did say that uh, over here on the right, I said, this is a long article 
So I've put the highlights in bold, okay? So I'm not gonna read from paragraph one all the way down through that. You, you can read it if you'd like to, but I wanna get to the fundamental, here it is. Notice the first bold text is paragraph number nine. And that's where the word first appears. So eight, eight paragraphs and they haven't said anything about, anyway, first, that our works cannot reconcile God or merit forgiveness of sins, grace, and justification, but that we obtain this only by faith when we believe that we are received into favor for Christ's sake, who alone has been set forth the mediator and propitiation a reference to 1 Timothy 2.5. Works cannot reconcile us to God or merit forgiveness of sins, grace, or anything. Thus, yes. I wrote a song about faith. Okay. Um, I would encourage you, but not, not today. We're, we're short of time. But uh, I'd I'd like to see it. Do, do you have it written? No, I, I just know. Okay, well, I, I'm I, I appreciate it. Uh, I'm not going to take the time today, but I'll I, I will engage you on that at some future class. Um, the I didn't make it bold, but the next sentence is of some interest. Notice the word despise. Whoever tr therefore trusts that by works he merits grace, despises the merit and grace of Christ and seeks a way to God without Christ. So uh, the, the logic here is, if you put any trust in yourself, any trust in yourself, then you are not putting all of your trust in Christ. And the word used here is despise. You might not think in those terms yourself. I mean, you don't, you don't think of yourself as despising Jesus. But Luther's, or, or actually this is Melanchthon. Melanchthon's argument is if, if, you, if you indicate that anything you provide is of value, then you're saying you didn't need Jesus, at least for that part. And that's why he uses the word despise Christ. It's pretty strong. Um, the uh, The confession over in the left column references Psalm 51. I'm trying to see where the reference is actually written, but I've misplaced it. Where, where is Somewhere in this long paragraph, they mention, well, it doesn't matter, I guess. I know it's there, but I don't see it. Um, notice that I did quote Psalm 51 on the right-hand column. Psalm 51. It's on the right first page, Doug. Pardon me? It's on the top right of the first page. Well, I know. No, that's where Psalm 51 is. But I'm saying that the I, I got that psalm from the confession. And I now I'm looking. I can't see where they quoted Psalm 51. But I'll I'll find it later, probably after class. Anyway, the point is Psalm 51 is an old testament writing. And I just want you to notice how Lutheran this sounds, okay? Um, scroll down, for example, I'll start, start with verse two. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. 
Remember our discussion about original sin last week. Look at the next sentence. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. This is Psalm 51. So this is Old Testament. A thousand years before Christ, David is um, on the money here with original sin. Um, well, okay, that's enough for that. Um, I want to... Uh, Now, back to the good works argument. Okay, I, I said that originally the Catholics were almost all works, no grace. They corrected that to make it a cooperation between grace and works. And, and, then, and then the Catholics were still complaining that the Lutherans were discouraging works. Okay, so the follow-up debate was, you guys are saying works don't matter, okay? Works don't help with your salvation. So the corollary of that argument is, these are the Catholics arguing against the Lutherans now. You're saying you don't have to do any good works. You can just live and let live. Tim has a saying, statement, uh, uh, abide and glide. Once you're a Christian, you can just glide for the rest of your glide for the rest of your life, abide and glide. Um, so, so that was the Catholics' counter argument. Are you saying that you don't do any good works? And the Lutherans argued that. And here, here, listen to the word necessary. They they still use the word necessary, but it's a it's an after salvation issue. A saved person, a Christian, will do good works. Or you could say it is necessary to do good works. Both are correct. But it has nothing to do with your salvation. It has to do with the fact that you have a new heart. Remember, Paul tells us we are a new creation. Well, if you believe that, shouldn't something good come out of that? Shouldn't the fact that you are a new creation create a new heart and thereby you respond with, what does God want me to do? So I, I end up doing what the Catholics might have considered good works but not because it adds to my salvation, but because I'm already saved and I want to do what God wants me to do. Um, remember, we have that line in uh, Scripture created. Here, here, here's the words from the uh, psalm. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. That's Psalm, again, a thousand years before Christ. Isn't that Psalm in our liturgy? Yeah, yeah. Well, where is it? Well, during Lent, we sang that in our liturgy. Okay. Yeah, I figured you'd know as the pianist. Yeah. Yeah. Created me a pure heart. And, and that and so and that's the argument that the Lutherans came back. With. Okay, yes, we, we, we don't say don't do good works. We say good works will come naturally from a saved person. They will they will want to do them. The will of God will work in them to help them figure out what they are, but they are not going to be things like they were under the Catholic Church, safe three Hail Marys, uh, take a pilgrimage to see some to see some to see some dead saints' bones, 
um, you know, there, there's, there's pay an indulgence. You're not going to pay indulgences. Those are definitely off the table. Those are not good works. But they, but and weren't the nobles collecting things? So the people would come and see them. Is that yeah, what you mean? Relics. Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, relics was the biggest sketch. Scam. Was, scam. Yeah, I, I said sham, but I guess that works yeah, too. Sham scam. and scam both work. Yeah. Um, and um, the, yeah. Your conscience is in your heart, so automatically you would follow your conscience as you say. Okay, that that that's that's consistent, right? Your the point we're making is that that the Holy Spirit working in us gives us a new heart, which then inclines us to do good works. So the, the Catholics were uh, wrong on that point. Now it does occur to me, I've mentioned the Catholics many times and I, and I forgot, to, I wanted to start with this, just a quickie. Um, about a month ago, we were talking about reconciliation with the Catholic church. And I said something along the lines that the Catholic church uh, has accepted uh, justification by grace. And I said something else. I said, to my knowledge, the Catholics have removed the excommunication of Luther and the Lutherans and the Lutherans have removed the excommunication of the Pope. Okay. It, tur it, tur it turns out that that's wrong. Okay. Uh, in 1999, there was an agreement called justification by grace. And the two churches, the Catholics and the Lutherans, have come very close to each other. But specifically, the, the, the popes since 1999, so that's 20 years, each pope, John Paul II, Benedict, and then now Francis, have been asked, well, in light of this agreement, shouldn't we remove the excommunication? And in each case, those three popes have said no. The re and and it, it, it's, a, it, it's an understandable reason, but it's still, it's, it's their reason. It's a Catholic reason. The Lutherans are not in full communi communion with the Catholic Church. We do not acknowledge the role of the Pope, right. the authority of the Pope. <laughs> and so... What they're, each one is saying is, this will come, but it, it, we, need that, we need that big step first. We, we, we need the Catholics and the Lutherans to be in full communion with each other before we say Luther was not a heretic. If you follow my logic or their, their logic there. Um, yeah, well, They've done a lot of good things. I mean, the, the Pope has has given a sermon in a, the local Lutheran church. Oh, wow. So, the, and and on one occasion, I don't know which which Lutherans were there <coughs> in the Vatican, but the the Pope gave communion to Lutheran uh, bishops and pastors. So it, things are good, but they're not that good. That 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 the problem is over. Okay, I wanna move on quickly to one that I don't think we have a big problem with, but um, <clears throat> in general, people, when they think of Catholics and, and Protestants, um, I'm trying to scroll, here it is. Worship of saints. Um, so this, this problem goes back 500 years, back to the very beginning of the uh, Reformation. The, the Catholics have always held some saints up and, and encouraged. The, the word here is worship, and I guess that's the correct word. They would, they would pray to a saint for help. They will pray to Mary. Well, that's uh, that's a big one. Yeah, that's that's included here. 
she's the big violation of this problem. But but even other saints, I, I don't know, uh, you know, Saint Michael, Saint Matthews, I, I don't know which ones, but the, a, a Catholic, a Catholic would pray to the saint for help on some on some issue. And the Lutheran position is relatively simple. There is only one mediator. There is only one person you pray to. Well, actually, there's three persons in the Godhead. You can pray to God the Father, God the Son, or God the Holy Spirit. But you pray to God. You do not pray to anything other than God. Um, it just, it's just, the Lutheran position is, it's always wrong. Um, the, um, notice, they refer to the fact that the scripture teaches the invocation of saints or to ask for help is, is wrong because there is only one Christ, one mediator, one propitiation, one high priest and intercessor, an intercessor. And only that one will be prayed to. Jesus promises to hear our prayer. So why would you pray to anybody else? Even Mary. Now, I, I, we're, we don't deny that Mary is probably in heaven. Um, that's not the issue. We're not, we're not saying that these saints aren't saved people, maybe even sitting around the throne room. We don't, we don't know, but there's no reason to think that they're not there. But the point is, why would you pray to someone else when you have direct access to God? You, you don't need to have a secondary person in the prayer. Um, well, that, that's tough. Let me, let me, I, I only gave one little hint of the argument. On the right hand column, I have this little section that says, on the subject of prayers of saints, in Revelation chapter 8, there is a reference to the prayers of the saints. Look here in verse 4. Revelation 8, 4. The smoke of the incense, together with the prayers of the saints, went up before God from the angel's hand. Okay. So, now, what do we do with that? The answer is we do nothing with that. But the Catholics make, there's, there's only a few places where there is a reference of, of someone giving intercession. And, and so this, this is only one example. We just think it's insufficient. Now she said, why do they pray to Mary? The idea in Mary's case, there is, remember, Remember the scene at the wedding in Cana where the, the somehow, we don't, we, we're not actually told who, but somebody tells Mary that they've run out of wine. And Mary goes to Jesus and Jesus solves the problem. There's, a, there's an example of someone now, they wouldn't have thought of it as prayer. They didn't pray to Mary, but they went to Mary to get Jesus to do something. In fact, Jesus, remember, Jesus actually said, it's not my time yet, woman. Don't, don't, don't bother me now. But, but he ends up doing it. But the point is, they, they make these kinds of connections. And, and um, the, the, the Lutheran position is, this just doesn't make any sense. Jesus is already your perfect mediator. He knows everything that you've ever done. He knows exactly why your sins need to be forgiven. There's nothing you can hide from, the, from him. 
So why would you ever go to another intercessor to get Jesus to pray for you? It just it makes no logical sense. They, they, yeah, they, they add additional people. Now, what, what do we do with saints? Just, just, to, just to be fair, we don't say ignore the saints. For example, around town, there are churches, Lutheran churches, that are named after saints. We don't happen to be one of them, but there's isn't there a Saint Matthew and a Saint Peter's and a you know okay Saint Paul's and list. So okay, so 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 right there we even so we name our churches after these people. So so what should we do? And the end. Go ahead. Well, yes, except that's i was asking for lutheran examples that's an episcopalian example but but that's that's fine um what we should do is instead of praying to saints we we use them as a good example these are people who had god active in their life so shouldn't shouldn't that be a good example Shouldn't we pay attention to that? Don't pray to them, but just acknowledge that this person had an active life with Christ. Um, to yeah, I think that they're then that that they had a. I'm listening. Oh, I, I was just going to say that all of these people here that we're talking about are sinners, just as we are. But the positive thing that we can get from their lives is just like John Kennedy's book, Profiles and Courage, these could be profiles yeah. of faith that lead an example for us. In, in faith, that's right, profiles in faith. Um, so we use... So like Dietrich Bonhoeffer uh, and... I, I, I highlighted them... Yeah, on the right hand side in this section of the document, notice I've got uh, three things that are in bold. We're going to honor the saints. One is Thanksgiving. We thank God for bringing forward such a good example that, that this person's life had meaning and was important. We can thank God for that. We can thank God that um, these examples strengthen our own faith. We can see where, where the saint persevered in, in uh, tribulation. So we can, we can take strength from that and strengthen our own faith. And then finally, the word imitation was used in the, uh, I, this was a copy of the apology on the right hand side. We can, we can imitate the life of saints. But none of those things are praying to the saint to try to convince Jesus to do something that would be in our favor. We, we don't think in those terms. Um, well, now, just, just to finish this document that I sent you, because I, I know there's a lot in this. Um, I think you asked me, Lewis, uh, are we doing all of the articles? And the answer is technically no, but essentially yes. Okay. Um, we, we ended with Article 21. And those are the 21 articles that at the time that the confession was written, they felt there was still significant disagreement about. Okay. Were there more articles added? Yes, there's, there's, there's seven more articles. I think it's a total of 28. Okay. There are 28 total. But notice this, this, this is written right here. At, at, this was kind of snuck in at the end of Article 21. This is the sum of our doctrine. That, that's really, that, that should have had its own section. What, the, the, one through 21 is our Lutheran doctrine. That's what that sentence says. Go ahead. 
You had mentioned that the Lincoln added things later. That's no, no, that's, no, that's different. That's a that's oh, that was different. Yeah, that was a that was more in the category of editing. He he would come back to this and say, you know, I didn't write that sentence correctly. I I should have done it. even the other one. Yes. One. Yeah, that's right. Um, da, 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 da. And was this agreed on or voted on or something? Oh yes, yes. There, there the, the, the signatories to the Augsburg Confession is a big deal. You can find those listed in any printing of them. Right. Is that just the twenty-one, or do they keep? <laughs> I think it included all twenty-eight. Um, I'm trying to find an easy way to say this. There is nothing that varies from Scripture or from the Church Catholic or from the Church of Rome as known from its writers. This being the case, they judge harshly to insist that our teachers be regarded as heretics. Okay, what they're saying is, if you look at these 21, look at these 21, this is good Christian teaching. There is no way the Catholics should call us heretics. Of course they did, and they excommunicated Luther. Um, I'm trying to find where, where the where the seven the seven are described. Um, well, I'm not I'm not finding the, the, the right language. Yeah. If you look if you look at your own document that I've sent to you, I've, I've, each week I send you the Augsburg Confession. Uh, for those of you at home, I'm going to put this in the. I want to put this in the uh, recording, so I'm going to to change this. What does that look like? Here it is. This is how the document it comes. 21 ends, 22 starts here. Then there's this middle paragraph. Articles in which are reviewed the abuses which have been corrected. That, that's a paragraph that's stuck in between 21 and 22. And so the implication is that the Catholics responded appropriately to these. And so therefore they're no longer- Which have been corrected by the Catholics. Yes, but I'm afraid it, it's, it, isn't, it is not that simple because for example, the very first one, both kinds and the sacrament, that refers to both wine and, and the bread. The Catholics didn't start giving their members wine until the 20th century. I, I, I think I'm right about that. Yes, I think you are. They gave bread only. And, and eventually, I think it was, I think it was um, Vatican II in the 60s. Right. They, they started giving bread and, wa and wine to the average but Joe. Right, then you say more Luther. <laughs> <laughs> but, my, but my point is, my point is that therefore, this could not have been corrected in 1530. This, this document we're studying was written in 1530. There's no way it was corrected. So I'm not, I, I'd have to talk to some theologian who could explain to me the difference. Marriage of priests. This says marriage of priests has been resolved. No way. In the Catholic Church, celibacy is still the, the role, the, the, the model for clergy. Maybe they weren't excommunicating them or something. Well, I do know that in some cases there are there are married Catholic priests but they had to have been married before they were ordained. Right. Yeah. And, the, well, and, they, and these are, Anglicans that's right, that, that's right. These are Anglicans who have become Catholics. 
So they don't make them divorce their wives. Which is like Lutherans becoming Catholics. Well, except that the, the, the I, I, I don't know the full answer. My, but my, 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 my point is that this implies that these things have been resolved. And I'm just saying, well, I don't even know that they're resolved. I don't, I don't know why you would refer to them this way. Abuses which have been corrected? Anyway. Well, but are they enumerating what's been corrected? Well, I, and that may take a more tedious, oh, I see, this, this is still wrong, but this is now right. Exactly. right. That's right. So anyway. Which have been corrected? And there are probably abuses which have not been corrected. Yes. So anyway, there are several more. Um, but we, we've only done 21. So anyway, so we are now finished. Uh, I'm going to change the share one more time, open up the Lord's Prayer, because I like to close with the Lord's Prayer. Let us, oops. Let us close with the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Okay, um, so... For the week after Easter, start reading your stories in Genesis. Remind, I'm give, one reminder is I'm looking for two kinds of, of uh, themes here. Do I see some image? They call it a type. Do I see a type of Christ? Do I see a foretaste of of Jesus in these Old Testament stories, okay? The other issue though is maybe I can't find any, any issue related to Jesus, but I can talk about God's relationship with his people. So how does this help me understand God's relationship with his people? Um, and I don't know for sure how long we're gonna spend on Adam and Eve, I mean, at one sense, in one sense, it's a simple story, but we'll we'll just have to see. Any other thoughts for the good of the cause? Enjoy it. Yeah. Enjoy it. Yeah. Thank you. Enjoy it. You're welcome. Yeah. See you, Bill. I'm going to close the meeting. Bye, Bill. Bye, Bill. Be blessed. Uh, enjoy Holy Week here. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Bill. <laughs>